Genesis chapter 35 is the first little passage of scripture that I'm going to read. I titled this morning's message, The Altar. And so we're going to be talking about the altar this morning. Uh, this is a passage in Genesis that talks about Jacob. And we're going to go ahead and read verses 1 through 4 real quick. Genesis 35, 1 through 4. God said unto Jacob, Arise, go up to Bethel and dwell there, and make there an altar unto God that appeared unto thee when thou fleddest from the face of Esau your brother. Then Jacob said unto his household and to all that were with him, Put away the strange gods that are among you, and be clean, and change your garments. And let us arise and go up to Bethel, and I will make there an altar unto God, who answered me in the day of my distress, and was with me in the way which I went. And they gave unto Jacob all the strange gods which were in their hand, and all their earrings which were in their ears. And Jacob hid them under the oak which was by Shechem. Uh, you know, to be honest with you, whenever I was first uh, looking at this particular passage of scripture, I put it in there to read mostly just because I wanted to kind of talk about the altar this morning. But as I was actually paying closer attention to the text itself, it talks a lot about really our new life in Christ, right? Whenever Jacob is in a chaotic time right here, if you look at the chapter that takes place before it, it's whenever his sister Dinah is tragically, she's, well, she's raped for lack of better words. Um, and, and a lot of things ensue because of that. And uh, Jacob's sons make some bad decisions. And then Jacob and, and, you know, the Lord leads him to go back to this place called Bethel, which really the word Bethel means the house of God. And if you would go back and you'd read the text of what took place in Jacob's life whenever that first happened, whenever he was fleeing from Esau and he ended up in this place. That was when he had that vision, whenever what's called Jacob's ladder, he had the vision of Jacob's ladder where heaven opened up and there was like a ladder that connected earth to heaven and that the angels of God were ascending and descending on the ladder. And whenever Jacob saw that, he said, surely this could be none other than the house of God. Right. And later on, we're told in uh, one of the Gospels that uh, Jesus makes the comment to Nathaniel and he says that from here on. You will see the, the angels of God ascending and descending upon the Son of Man. And so what J Jesus was saying to someone who would have known the Old Testament was that I am the ladder. I am the ladder or the, the access point that, that Jacob saw when he was in Bethel, where he saw the angels of God ascending and descending. I am that access point. I am the connection between heaven and between earth. And, but what the Lord's telling Jacob to do here is, is to go and to build an altar in this place. And whenever one of the things that we see is it says to put the strange gods away from you, to put the strange God to change your garments. And we see the picture of uh, cleansing. We see the picture of, of new life. We see the picture of putting the old behind us, right, and embracing the new. And all this is taking place uh, and because God wants the altar to be built. And I can tell you that Jacob built an altar there and he offered up sacrifice unto the Lord. And in the Old Testament... If you were going to show faith to God, that's what you did. You, you offered up a sacrifice unto the Lord. If you wanted to serve the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, you built an altar and you offered up sacrifices uh, to, to, because that was the answer. That was the answer from the beginning since the fall took place. All the way uh, up until, you know, till the end that it would be fulfilled in the cross of Jesus Christ. And we understand that. Right. And the, and the reason why is because this is where God makes the innocent those that are guilty. He provides innocence for them. And we can see that out of Leviticus chapter 17, verse 11. If he would if you would go there real quick where the scripture says in Leviticus chapter 17, verse 11, for the life of the flesh. Is in the blood and I have given it to you upon the altar to make an atonement for your souls. It is the blood that makes an atonement for the soul. Amen. You know, I've talked about this before. You know, we talk about the blood a lot. And, you know, I, I just like to think about these kinds of things, you know, to think things through. Because for a long time, I've shared this with you before, that one time I was actually preaching. One of the times I was preaching at the old church that I used to go to. And I was talking about being born again. And as I was preaching, it was like for the first time in my life, I really got a revelation. I had been talking about being born again 
forever. But I really got a revelation of the fact that my old man that was born like Adam received a new birth. Now, that may be common knowledge to you because we've talked about it so many times. But you can talk about something a whole lot. and You can know something in your head. But it's like when the Lord turns the light bulb on, something that simple became a revelation to me. And, and it's the same thing about the blood. We talk a lot about the blood. I can remember in the church that I was first saved in. I've shared that story many times when the preacher was talking about the blood over and over again. And that night I went up and I gave my heart to the Lord. I really didn't necessarily know what it meant. But as I've thought about it, what it's talking about here is that in this physical realm that we live in, the life of the creature is in the blood. It, the, the life force that delivers oxygen to at the cellular level that keeps us going, that takes away the waste product from our bloodstream and, and puts back what we need in our bloodstream. It is the blood. And so when the blood is poured out, it's the life of the creature that is that is now lost. And so on the altar, what God was saying here is I've given the blood on the altar to make atonement for your soul. The word atonement means to be purged, to be cleansed, to be pardoned. So God gave the blood, gave the altar, which was fulfilled in the cross because it's an instrument of death. And, and it required death of the innocent to provide uh, innocence. For the guilty, amen, and and we see that, and that's really what we're talking about to, to this morning is we're talking about the altar and what it means to you and what it means to, to myself uh, in our walk with the Lord. Kenneth Weist, I've shared some of his work before. He's a Greek scholar that I've read behind a lot. I learned about him from, from Brother Swagger. Brother Swagger got some revelation from Kenneth Weiss. He's an old Baptist Greek scholar, and he had a, really a lot to say. He had a great understanding of redemption. And listen, he had a great understanding of not just the cross regarding forgiveness, but the cross and what it means as we continue to walk with God and daily for access to grace. Anyway, he, he made this comment. He said both Cain and Abel built an altar on that day. Whenever you look at the offerings that Cain and Abel, the two brothers, we remember the story, right? The two offerings that they offered unto God, they both essentially were building an altar because they were making an offering unto God. And, and you know, the altar of Cain was one that offers to God the work of men's hands. If you'll remember the story, Cain was a tiller of the ground. That means that he produced, right? He had to plow the ground. He had to plant the seed. He had to make sure that it was weeded properly. He, he produced a harvest from it. And this is what he wanted to offer unto the Lord. Whereas the altar of Abel was one that required the sacrifice of an animal. It required the shedding of blood. Many people have tried to argue over whether or not this was really the case. Was it because it was a blood offering? But listen, when you go back to the beginning and you see the answer that God had to for the forgiveness of man's sins immediately in the garden, we see a repetitive pattern that it requires sacrifice offered unto God. Unfortunately, men have flocked to Cain's altar. Because mankind wants to be able to give something that he perceives as valuable unto God. That's right. He men have flocked to Cain's altar. They want, the man wants to offer up something to God. And, and listen, there's nothing wrong with your motive wanting to give something back to God. That's not the problem. To give your praise to the Lord, to give your heart to the Lord, to give finances to the kingdom of God. There's nothing wrong if the motive of your heart is to give back to God knowing that he has given unto you. There's nothing Amen. wrong with that. The motive becomes improper whenever man thinks that he has something worthy in and of himself to offer unto the Lord. That was the sin of Cain. Cain felt as though, no, I'm not going to go this way. See, the problem is, is that God had already revealed to Adam on how he was to be approached. Whenever Adam attempted through his own hands to, to produce the fig leaves, to cover his own nakedness, God says, no, that it's going to not is going to require the death of this animal in order to do that. So mankind knew, but yet in Cain's heart, he refused to go the way that had been learned so far up into that point by it had been taught by God. And instead he wanted to offer something that he had, that he was, that, that he thought was a value. He didn't value what God wanted. He instead valued what he had to offer unto God. But more often than not, people will once again flock to Cain's altar that embraces the work of man's hands while they shun the work of God's plan. They don't want to run to the plan that God has ordained. And the most likely reason why is that in order to go God's way, man must come to the end of himself. Man has to recognize that in and of himself, he doesn't have anything good to offer to God. 
Uh, you know, and, and he cannot think that his works are worthy. This, and this is a hard thing for the stomach of man to digest. Yeah, really, if you think about it. Because if we look at our own hearts and our own lives, it's a hard thing for the, for the stomach, especially of the self-righteous or the prideful. And we all, we all deal with that to some extent. And if we act like we don't, then we're not being honest with ourselves. Because every last one of us have been injected with the pride. The problem with pride, the problem with self-control, the problem of the refusal to, to surrender self in the eyes of God. And some of us worse than others, right? Uh, some of us worse in certain areas than other areas. But all of us deal with it to some extent. And it's hard for man to, to, to digest this concept because you know why? Because he thinks so highly of himself. That's right. He does. And mankind thinks so highly of himself and he thinks so highly of his own righteousness. He thinks so highly of his own motives. Oh, he's always doing something right. And he's just so helpful towards everybody. He thinks uh, so highly of his own works and he sees his decisions and his way of thinking <laughs> as superior to the decisions and the way of thinking of those that surround him. One thing I can tell you, I'm far from having arrived. I can promise you that. But one thing that I prayed that the Lord would give me was a teachable spirit and the ability to be able to see my own self. I want to be able to see my own self. Sometimes I don't like what I see. You know, but I want to be able to understand and to realize that I don't have it all figured out. That hasn't always been an easy thing for Matt. I'm just being honest. Matt would rather always to try to study harder. To, and, and listen, whenever I think I'm right and I think you might be wrong, boy, I'm going to let you know about it. If, if, you know, there's something in me that has been that way. I can, I can admit that. Maybe I'll make myself vulnerable, but it's okay. Because, see, the more I admit it, the, I believe that the Lord will use that to humble me in some way, shape, or form. If I'm willing to come out clean with it, you know. And, um, but that's the problem that we have. Is that so often we just think we're, our intelligence is superior to those around us. Our motives are right. Everybody else's is wrong. We got it figured out. They don't have it figured out. God does not work with that. God can't work with that. Because, because it's the same sin that Satan had. Which was pride in the elevation of self. God says I resist the proud. And I give grace to the humble. And I've said this before. I used to say it all the time. That the resistance is like the idea of two opposite polars of a magnet. You try to push them together. And instead of being connected to it. They, put, they repel each other. And they push themselves away. That's what pride does to God. We don't sometimes realize that, but it's in our life. And sometimes the way that we are, it's repelling the Lord away from us. It's at the altar, though, that something dies. The life of the sacrifice is taken and returned. God's presence, which is his life, is given. That's why true repentance cannot take place unless self recognizes its own failures and shortcomings and recognizes its dependence on God. That's a big part of the plan of God, a separation from the old man and to and what he used to be and what he was built upon to becoming the new man who understands God because he understands the ways of God because the word of God and the spirit of God are now working in him and revealing to him the way that God is and God is very selfless and he's proven that to us in the sense that he was the offended party I like to say that a lot to remind us all God was the offended party. See, the reason that I say that is because maybe sometimes, you know, I, I do. I, I read a lot of things. I've read a lot of things. You know, some people way back in the day, it's not important where the information came from. But, you know, there were people that helped to write, study the New Testament manuscripts where all these new translations come from. And in one of them, they were actually very respectful of Charles Darwin. This guy is Westcott and Hort who helped come up with these newer manuscripts where all these new translations come from. And I have my reasons for not, not wanting to recognize those manuscripts. But, but nevertheless, uh, one of the things that one of them believed was, was that, that the sacrifice of Jesus paid a price to the enemy. Because, because, because the idea was, was that man had now become in bondage and enslaved to the enemy. And so in order for him to be released, this sacrifice had to be offered to the enemy. No, the, the enemy wasn't the offended party. 
Mankind wasn't the offended party. God was the Amen. offended party. This is God's plan. God offered Jesus as a sacrifice to pay the penalty that man had engaged himself with because now what man had allowed to come into his life separated him from the presence of God. No, this was God's plan. Amen. And this was God's way of, of removing mankind from this sin of the old life that he received from his father, Adam. And moving him into this new life. Amen. And, and that's one of the things that I wanted to talk about first. That's really point number one. Separation. The altar of separation. If you'll turn with me to 2 Samuel chapter 24 verse 18. And then we'll go to uh, verse 21. It said, And Gad came that day to David and said unto him, Go up, rear an altar unto the Lord in the threshing floor of Arana, the Jebusite. Verse 21. And Arana said, Wherefore is my Lord the king come to his servant? And David said, To buy the threshing floor of thee, to build an altar unto the Lord, that the plague may be stayed from the people. You know, the word plague just simply means a pestilence. I mean, nowadays we, we, we've heard common words like anthrax. You remember when all that stuff after 9-11 happened, all this flurry of thinking that they found this anthrax powder. They shut down the Capitol one day and, you know, Ebola virus. These are pestilences. These are sicknesses. Now, the word also literally can, in the Old Testament and here describing divine judgment. In some way, God had placed judgment on the camp of Israel. Uh, we don't know exactly what had happened, but David had been given a choice. He could be put into the hands of his enemy or he could be put into the hands of God. The whole reason why all of this happened was because David, in his heart, decided that he was going to number, he was going to number how many fighting men he had in the kingdom of Israel. Now, why would it be that God would cause a plague to come upon his own people because of the fact that David decided that he was going to number all of his fighting men? It's because, again, the motive. Because there's one time when God told, told David to number the men, right? God told David, I want you to number the men. But the truth of the matter is, is that David numbered the men because what he was doing is he was looking at the strength of his army rather than looking at the strength of God. And what's interesting is this, is that David said, when it's all said and done, I don't want to put my hand, my life in the hands of the enemy, of my enemy. Instead, I'll put my life in the hands of God and I'll cry out for mercy unto the Lord. And when the plague hit and thousands of men were dying, the plague stopped right there at the threshing floor of Aaron and the Jebusite. Wow. And that's where the angel of the Lord told David he needed to build an altar was right there on the threshing floor. And the reason that I'm calling this the altar of separation is because that's what a threshing floor is all about. Many of you have heard me preach on threshing floors before. We've talked about it uh, even in the, in the book of Matthew, right? Where it's in Matthew chapter 3, verses 11 through 12, we see the picture of the threshing floor. And, and this altar was built on a threshing floor, which is a place of separation. If we take a look at Matthew chapter 3, verses 11 and 12, this is John the Baptist. He says, I indeed baptize you with water under repentance, but he that comes after me is mightier than I, whose shoes I am not worthy to bear. He shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire, whose fan is in his hand, and he will thoroughly purge his floor and gather his wheat into the garner. But he will burn up the chaff with unquenchable fire. You know, I personally believe this particular passage of Scripture is not talking so much about the separation between the sheep and the goats, which that's also going to take place in the end. Separation between the sheep and the goats talks about the fact that there's some people who were believers and there were some people who were unbelievers and the difference between who will go to heaven and who will go to hell. But in this case, it's all part of the grain. The piece of grain was one was one entity, right? It grew it had a stalk of grain, had a head on it. You've seen pictures of that before. It's got little pieces of grain, but around the edges it would have that husk, okay, that was that was called chaff. And, and I mean I know I've described it like this before, but almost like a peanut that's got the skin on it. So so what that that has to be uh 
that has to be separated. I just learned as I was studying for this that that's where the term threshold came from. Because sometimes they would do threshing on the inside of a, a building. They would have some type of a, 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 not a mechanical, but some type of a system that would allow a fan to blow. And they would do it in a building and they'd put a big old piece of wood at the, at the door to prevent the grain from going back out of the door. That's what, so that's where the word threshold comes from. But the threshing was the separation of the grain from the chaff, right? And, and so it would be grinded. Many times in the, before before they had any kind of you know, way to do it uh, with, with the stones that they would roll over the grain, they would stomp on it or whatever they could in order to separate the two pieces. And then, the, so a threshing floor would be a rounded out, flattened area. And then when it says a fan, really it was kind of like a big pitchfork or a shovel type thing. And I've said it before, but they would shove the pitchfork up under there and they would throw the grain, the whole thing up in the air. And then when the wind would blow, the chaff, which was lighter, would be blown away. And like the text says, the chaff would be burned away up in unquenchable fire. The chaff is that part of the grain and, and the grain would be stored into the garner or into the barn, into the storage place, because that was the part that was worth keeping, right? And so in this sense, the harvest is considered you and I. The harvest is considered the people of God. And that there's a part to the people of God that needs to be removed. John the Baptist says, I baptize you with water, but he's going to baptize you with the Holy Ghost and fire. The work of the Holy Spirit and the fire of God in our lives does that. It brings us through a purging process, a separation process, where the, the things that are in us that are not of the Lord, the things that are in us that are of the chaff, that, that are part of us, God desires to remove away. This isn't going to be the, the parts of us that are going to inherit eternal life. Amen. And so the altar that David built that stopped the plague because God's people were not, not, you know, were David anyway, God's leader was not trusting in the Lord, but instead he was trusting in how powerful his army was. And many times we trust in our own strength. Many times we trust in our own ways or in somebody else that's going to supposedly help us in a particular situation. I'm not saying it's never good to receive help from somebody. That's not what I'm getting at. We have to be led by the Lord. The problem is, is that if we're so fearful that if we don't get something from somebody else or if something gets cut off from us from someone else that we think we're not going to make it, then that means that we're not truly trusting in the Lord. And that was what was going on in David's life right there. He had a hard time believing God that, that, that God was going to be his strength and he chose instead to number his military to number his army and a plague hit but good news the plague stopped at the threshing floor amen god said build an altar here because it's at the altar that whenever we're that whenever we're not handling our business right with god we can make things right with the lord amen and that's where the plague was stopped this is once again the sanctification process we call we talk about that a lot in this church but that's what it is. The, the chaff is being separated from the grain. It's the purifying of the heart and the mind of man. And this is a lifelong process that doesn't happen overnight, right? Sin, like this plague that was caused in David's life, sin causes a plague on man. It causes a plague in his heart. It's a sickness that affects the way he thinks, his motives, his actions. But faith in the completed sacrifice of God forgives all sin. And gives access to grace. His presence, right? The, 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 the altar, that's what the altar does. It gives access to the presence of God. Gives access to His grace. Which gives divine power for change. For separation. I don't think I can say that enough. I need to slow down because I use a lot of words. And I know that I say it a lot. But I want us to, to understand that. That's the whole point in the sacrifice. That's the whole point in the altar. It, it, is that it gives access to the presence of God. What do you need in your life? What are you going through in your life? What do you need grace for in your life? Whatever it is. Whatever it is that makes you even wake up and want to come to church. It, you know, because you love the Lord or whatever. Whatever it is that you need from God in order to access Him in His presence, there has to be an altar involved in there. A fa faith continued in what God's plan truly is, right? And his divine power gives us change that results in separation. 
Here's another scripture, Deuteronomy 27, 5. I know that we've taught this before. When we went through the Bible, we'll teach it again coming up. Because we're about to hit Deuteronomy. But this is another way of saying just what I just said. That David took matters into his own hands. Right? He counted his military. This is a similar. God doesn't want us trusting in other things other than him. Amen? That's, that's a mouthful that I just said by, that, by the way. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, until you really, sometimes I feel like maybe I overdo it. You know, Lord, I hope that the Holy Spirit does his work while we're preaching, you know, and, and causes to generate in the mind of man the things that God's dealing with him about the, each individual life, right? Because if, if it's left up to me to, to hit each individual situation just right for each person's life, we're in a world of hurting because I can't come up with enough circumstances or particular life issues that each and every person could be dealing with, right? We need the Holy Spirit to reveal these things to us Amen. whenever the word goes forth. It says right here in Deuteronomy 27, 5, there shall, and there shalt thou build an altar unto the Lord thy God. An altar of stones, thou shalt not lift up any iron tool upon them. God didn't want man's hands taking iron tools and chisels and preparing the rocks and making them look a certain way, ornate, ornamental. No. Just want you to get some old, right, rugged rocks. I don't want you to build an altar unto me. I don't want you to put an iron tool on them. I don't want you to change the way that they look. Because I don't want you producing something and, look, and, and, and turning around and saying, look how beautiful of a thing that I produced unto you, Lord. Look at what a beautiful thing that I was able to accomplish and do. No, this is the work of the Lord. The altar is the work of the Lord. From the beginning of the fall all the way until the end, this is the work of and the plan of the Lord. This is another example of how God doesn't want the hand of man involved in the work of his altar. I was talking to somebody the other day, uh, and, he, and this person made a good point. They said that if people aren't dealing with problems related to drugs or alcohol or lust or tobacco, then many times they don't really see the necessity of the message of the cross. You know, whenever we talk about, it. and you know, you could call the message of the cross so many different things. I've talked about this before, you know, because whenever you say the cross, sometimes people don't understand. They think that you're just talking about forgiveness of sin. And, and no, it, it, it's really the whole covenant of God. It's the whole plan of God. It's the whole gospel of Jesus Christ. But if people aren't dealing with certain things, or sometimes if they hear us use these things as examples, they're like, oh, well, I'm not dealing with that. Then, and they think that they, that they don't have a need for, for the gospel, really, is what they're saying. Look, let me just use this as an example. Back in the day, whenever I was first preaching at the other church that I went to, I tried to, to, to bring this message to the people that, that we were there with. And, and, you know, the pastor really did buy, seem to buy into it for, for some period of time that this truly was the gospel. That was the big point that I was trying to get across to the people that were there. And you had people that had been saved for a long time. One of the things that I've realized is that you deal with so many different types of people. And, and, and you know, when you deal with people that have been saved for a long time and have read and studied the Bible for some period of time and know some scriptures, and then you start telling them that some of the stuff that they believed maybe wasn't right. See, for me, I had been struggling so bad that when the Lord revealed to me that many of the scriptures that I thought meant one thing didn't mean that after all, I was like really happy to find out that it wasn't the word of God that wasn't working, but that it was Matt that wasn't working and that hallelujah, God's word does work. But sometimes whenever you start to talk to people and they've been around a little while, they get it, they take it offense. They're like, oh no, brother, I've been teaching that you got to put on the armor of God every morning for the last 20 years. Now you're going to walk up in here and tell me that I don't have to wake up in the morning and put on the armor of God? No, the Lord loves it. When I wake up at five bells and I begin to place my armor on, he loves the fact that I'm preparing myself to enter into that old nasty world. And, and he loves the fact that I never forget one time. You see, the, and, and, and while they may not say that, the point is, is that you come along, and especially probably my, my, my personality is the problem, 
But you come along, you have the wrong way that you present it. Guess what it does? It cuts to the heart of man. But you don't even have to. It doesn't even, we can all blame it on Matt's personality, but it ain't really on Matt's personality. You say the wrong thing to the wrong person and pride rises up in their heart and they don't want to hear it, right? And then you have some people that are like, oh, that, that's the simplest thing I've ever heard, man. That, that's Christianity 101, the cross. But they don't even get it. They don't even understand what it's really talking about. They think they got it. They think they understand. But the reality of it is, is that no, it's not that simple to figure out. The truth, why? Because man's pride stands in the way. And in order for the cross to really work in our lives, there has to be a surrender. There has to be a surrender of self to the plan of God and to the things of God. And not just in the big areas of our life, but in every single circumstance Everywhere. and every issue that right. we face daily. And there's so many little nuances and so many little things that are taking place in our life and so many times that we do, we rebel against God. Yes. Thank God for the cross and the fact that He justifies us and that He gives us grace because if not, we would be in a real world of hurting because each and every one of us in this place have failed God, continue to fail God on a regular basis. Sometimes it's not as big as what it used to be, but nevertheless... And so I was talking and, and, you know, this person was saying, you know, people just don't understand if they don't have problems with drugs or alcohol or, or tobacco or whatever. They don't see the necessity of this message. But what they don't understand is that the message of the cross is about access to the presence of God. And in the presence of God, whatever ails an individual can be healed. Whatever ails an individual can be healed. Broken hearts. Pains of childhood. I mean, if you stop for a second and you remember your childhood, I mean, we're not that big of a crowd, but there's a lot of different things that can affect a person's mind, heart, soul that they experienced when they were young, things that they try to forget, things that they want to push back, right? Uh, I mean, do I have to use myself always as an example? Because, I mean, I get, I get kind of tired of talking about myself. But, you know, each and everybody in this room has a story. Yeah. Each and everybody in this room has a story. Some people, you know what? Your life really wasn't all that bad. Because sometimes whenever I think about the fact that I kind of had some rough stuff when I was growing up, I was thinking, but you know what? I've heard some way worse stories than mine. Yeah. Stories about people that weren't just verbally abused sometimes, but physically abused. And then it gets even worse than that. There might be somebody in this room. Who had some bad things happen to them as a child. The point that I'm trying to make is this. I ain't got nothing to do. Oh yeah. That person may have run to relationships to try to fill that emptiness. That person may have run to spending money to try to get rid of that pain. That person might have run to drugs or alcohol to try to hide or to numb that pain. But what I'm trying to tell you is, is this, those are just the surface issues and the band-aids that people choose in order to try to remedy the underlying problem. And what the message of the cross will do is once again, it gives you access to the presence of God, the grace of God, where a divine work from God can take place on the inside of the heart and he can bring a true healing. Right. None of that other stuff is going to, you can't add sin to the problem and, and, and expect that it's going to fix no, it, right? right? But the truth of the matter is, is that if we would understand that because of what God has done is he's provided a way for us to access his presence and that when we allow his presence into our situation, it can bring healing and it can bring maturity. It can bring maturity of life. It can bring maturity of our walk with the Lord. And but listen, it'll affect every aspect of your life. That's right. If you go along your life because you've been hurt when you were young and you've always been on the defense because you're scared that somebody else, you can't trust people, you're scared somebody else is going to take advantage of you, and you're always in the midst of a conflict, you're always in the midst of a, on the defense, right? Do you know how hard it is to hold down a job when you feel that way? I'm telling you, it's not. Do you see people? I'm not trying to say that that's always the case. But what I am trying to say is, is this, is that sometimes there's things that are going on deep down inside of our lives and we feel as though it's everybody else's problem and fault around us. But the reality is, is that no, there's a problem with us. And that until we can recognize that and allow the Lord to have his way on the inside of our hearts and to deal with us, you know, the personality issues that we have, there, there's no better way 
to allow to, to, to have a remedy for the personality problems that we have. Therefore, we have a problem. And if we don't deal with it and address it, it's just going to turn into a bigger problem. The problem is that you've never allowed, you've never accessed the cross to allow the Holy Spirit to show you what's on the inside of your heart. And you believe that you can just walk around and treat anybody any old way that you want to. Guess what? That doesn't work. It doesn't work in the real world. You can't treat people in the old way that you want to. And many times, that's what people think. They think that they can just act however they want. They can talk down to people if that's what they want to. They can feel like they're elevated above people. And you might be elevated. You might be a boss. That doesn't mean you're going to sit and go around treating your employees or your workers like a piece of trash. You can't do that. You can't. How, how long do you think that your staff will continue to work for you if you treated everybody that way? Mm -hmm. See, that's what I'm trying to say. All these little personality attributes at the same time. There's some people that allow people to walk all over them. I'm getting real specific this morning. Maybe I'm not trusting that the Lord would speak specificity to your heart, but I'm getting real specific this morning. You might have a personality issue that you allow people to walk all over. That's not God's will. God's will is not that we would just constantly keep our mouth shut and allow people to take advantage of. Yeah, I'm not trying to say that God, that Jesus wasn't meek and he didn't open his mouth. And he was, I understand that he was led like a lamb to the slaughter and he did not open his mouth. There's a time and a season for everything Solomon said. Sometimes we keep our mouth shut because that's a big problem that we've had and we don't know how to. And the Lord would have us to learn how to humble ourselves and to be quiet. But sometimes there's injustices that are taking place and we need to learn how to be able to communicate those things out. Out. There's a right way and a wrong way for things to be communicated out and for things to be talked about with the spirit of God behind us and helping us to do that. Right. With a with with a with a, an attitude of, of, of the spirit of Christ in us. All right. So that's that's just that's another example. I, I kind of got into personality traits and things that are going on in our lives. But whatever it is. The pains of childhood, emptiness of heart, the thought life, the unfairness of life. I mean, sometimes you, you look around and even in your own, you, you, you feel like, man, life has been kind of unfair. Well, guess what? Life is unfair. I'm not trying to belittle it, but it is. But you can sit here and sometimes it's more unfair. Like I, I see that we, you know, we're mostly, anyway, maybe... There's a lot of times people feel like they were born into a cultural situation where life's been unfair to them. You understand what I'm getting at? Do I have to spell it out? People feel like they've been, that life is unfair to them because of the color of their skin. And, and you know what? I'm starting to realize they're probably right. To some extent, life has been unfair to them because of the color of their skin. But once again, God doesn't want you always feeling like a victim. God wants to give you the strength that you need to be able to rise up, amen, and to be to do what it is that he's called you to do. I'm just trying to say that's just one example of how people could feel in their heart and in their minds that life has been unfair to them and that all of their life they never are able to rise to the place where the Lord would have had them and to be able to accomplish what God would have had them to be able to accomplish. I try to make it specific because, you know, there's two types of people. One, I don't have to hit anything specific. Instead, they know what the problem is in their life, right? They're, they've been dealing with it. They've been looking to the Lord to, to reveal things to them and to help them, right? And then the other person is the kind that says, he didn't hit mine, so he's not talking about me, right? But the reality is, is that each and every one of us, there's things in our life that the gospel is so applicable and he's desiring to do the work in us. Amen. If we're not running to the threshing floor of God and instead we are putting iron tools of the work of man affecting the work of God, then we're not allowing the Lord to have his way in those situations. But the church has been flooded with an outside influence of the world. And now we embrace counseling and Jesus. We embrace therapy and Jesus. We embrace medicine and Jesus. Well, why you got to go there, preacher? Because I just listed every other thing I knew that I could possibly list. 
all of the issues and reasons why you would need to go somewhere else. You would go to a relationship. You would go, you would go to, you know, to drugs. You would go to alcohol. You would go to spending money. You would go to all of these things to try to find a fulfillment. And guess what? When none of that would work, even though you went to church, you would go to a counselor to help put a band-aid on the problem. You would go to take a pill. To put, to take the edge off. Am I fussing about people that are taking pills and medicine? No, that's not what I'm doing. And sometimes people can't hardly even function. If they don't know the gospel, what else are they going to do? What else are they going to look to? Right? But what I'm trying to get at is this, is that God wants to be our all in all. He wants us to be able to trust him. And sometimes, listen, people don't like it when you preach this way, but I'm just here to tell you the truth. Sometimes when we put those things in us and we're hoping that it will take the edge off, it prevents us yes. from being able to really allow God to deal with what's really right. going on in there. It's like there's a shield and a block that prevents the Lord from reaching in and doing the work that needs to be done on the inside of our hearts. And, and, and much of the church has embraced this way of thinking. Why? Because they've rejected the message of the cross. They've rejected the finished work of Christ. That says that God has already provided everything that you need. Oh, well, you know, I can remember back at the church I used to go to. They say, well, you know, the Bible doesn't have the answer for everything. <laughs> and I can remember the preacher told me, well, it doesn't. I'm like, well, hold on a second. I was sharing with somebody just recently that, you know, the Bible might not tell you thou shalt not gamble. But whenever you understand the whole of Scripture and you realize that gambling destroys people's lives, that there is a demonic, there has to be a demonic spirit behind something that would prevent somebody from being able to get up and move away from a card table, but instead would have a $150,000 home and, and a $30,000 car and all these other types of things. And within a five year period of time, all of it's wiped away and they've lost everything. No, there's something bigger. It ain't just an addiction. There's a demonic spirit behind that thing that's driving that person and giving giving them an inability, turning them into a slave and preventing them from being able to just simply get up from a card table and walk away. When that, whenever you know that there's something like that, I don't need a scripture that says thou shalt not roll the dice. <laughs> because I know that there's a spiritual entity behind that. There's a principality and a power behind that that's driving that individual to destroy their life. That means it's darkness and not light. Right. That means it's not of the Lord. The Lord. Yeah. Amen? Amen. And so that's all I'm trying to get at is, is that they don't understand. But yet because the church and we got leaders like that in the church. And I'm not trying to pick on leaders. I'm just trying to make a point. We got a new way of thinking. We got a new way of thinking because we're in a new innovative world and things are changing. And so we got to let the world come in and we can't be so harsh on things. We can't we can't be so dogmatic on things. We can't come against these things that are obviously black and white. Instead, we have to tone it down a little bit because if we're not careful, then we'll drive people away. And so because we do that and because we don't speak the truth and we don't stick to our guns, whether whether you got complete victory in your life or whether I got complete victory in my life is neither here nor there. The gospel has the remedy for victory that we need for each and every aspect of our life. Amen. That's the gospel. This is God's plan and this is how he works. And, and the problem that we run into is because we don't believe that and because we don't preach that, we have to find other ways. To allow people in the church to find what it is that they're looking for. And so that's why we employ counselors. That's why we employ Christian psychologists and, that, and all these other things. And what we do is we, take, we, we, we make an amalgamation. It's a fancy word for when you mix two uh, metals together. You, you make an alloy. We take psychology, we take theology, we mix the two together. And we take some scripture and we take some Freud and we put the two together. And we try to tell the people, oh, this is going to fix you. No, this is not true Christianity. This is not true the way that God really works. This is, this is David counting the number of the people in his kingdom. This is man taking an iron tool and chiseling away at the stone. This is man putting his hands into the work of God and trying to take the place of God and trying to figure things out because he does not either understand the gospel or he refuses to submit to the gospel. 
That's the first thing. It's an altar of separation. God wants to separate out the old and he wants to move us towards the new. Amen? Point number two is that it's an altar of peace. Let's go to Judges chapter 6 verse 24. It says, Then Gideon built an altar unto the Lord and called it Jehovah Shalom. Unto this day, it is yet an Ophrah of the Abizarites. The whole premise or the story of Gideon, if you'll remember, is this is during the time frame of the judges. We've talked about that many times, right? That Joshua, after the wanderings of Israel in the wilderness, brought the children of Israel into the promised land, and then Joshua died. Then we go through about a 400-year period known as the Judges. And God would, God's people would enter into sin with the nations around them. And essentially what that means is they would go back into the world. And when they would go back into the world, God would allow them to be brought under bondage. And that's essentially what happens to the New Testament Christian that goes back to the world and he connects himself to the world. He finds himself in bondage. But then many times we cry out to the Lord because we listen. If you've truly been saved and the Holy Spirit lives in your heart, you're never going to be the same. The world's never going to be the same to you. You'll never be able to go back and, and to try to enjoy it the way that you ever did before because there's new life on the inside of you. And in this story of Gideon, the first scene that we see, Gideon's actually threshing grain. But he's doing it where he's hiding near a wine press. And, and, and the Midianites have come in with their camels that are more than the sands on the seashore. And they're just, they're stealing the harvest of the children of Israel. They're, they're, their cattle have nothing to graze on. There's nothing but the, the, the land has been ravaged because that is what sin does. It ravages the human heart. It ravages the life. It takes away. You've seen the story of people that have given wholeheartedly back into sin or even a life of sin. Some of you know family members that have seen people that have given their life to sin and or you have experienced it in your own life what it has done how it destroys how it takes away how it rips apart it takes so many things away from people especially things like drugs and alcohol for whatever reason the spirit behind that is so horrendous it just rips people's lives apart and leaves them with nothing that's essentially what's happening here but the lord ends up telling gideon to build this altar, and this altar is called Jehovah Shalom, the God of peace. Yeah. Shalom, with the name Jerusalem. Jerusalem is the city of peace. It's the altar of peace, because at the altar of God, amen, there is peace. Amen. Just as in the previous story, when there was a plague because of sin, in this story, there is bondage and loss of possessions because of sin. But in the midst of bondage and loss, there is chaos. But Gideon builds an altar that states Jehovah Shalom. He is the God of peace. And no matter what you and I are going through, and I know I say this a lot, but you got to believe me when I tell you, no matter what we're going through, no matter how much chaos we face, I'm here to tell you that God has provided a plan for peace. Look at Luke chapter 2, verses 10 through 14. It says in verse 10 of Luke chapter 2, And the angel said unto them, this is the birth, this is talking about the birth of Jesus. And when the angels found the shepherds in the field, the angel said unto them, fear not for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people for unto you is born this day in the city of David, a savior, which is Christ the Lord. And this shall be a sign unto you. You shall find the babe wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger and suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest and on earth, peace, goodwill towards men. As I, would, as I would put this scripture down here, I was thinking to myself, you know, those angels on that day that sang that song, that heavenly hymnal, that, that pronounced the birth of the Lord, they knew something on that day that it's been a real hard thing to teach mankind. Because mankind, for the most part, what they, what they understood was that the birth of Jesus signaled peace on earth for mankind. Why has that been so hard for us as human beings to wrap our mind around? I'm going to tell you why. Because the first time that Jesus showed up, 
He didn't come to bring peace to the neighborhood. He came to bring peace to the heart. Well, what are you talking about? Well, until people receive the peace of the Lord in their heart, they don't have a revelation of what the whole purpose of Jesus' birth was. Because Jesus' birth was ultimately that it would end at an altar, that whenever we would put our faith in that, it would allow peace to enter the inside of our heart. You have people all over the world that live in war-torn countries. Their neighborhoods are ravaged by anything but peace. Their neighborhoods and the lives that they live, you and I, don't. we have the luxury so far of living in America, and we haven't experienced that. Thank God. We haven't experienced troops coming through our neighborhood and, and seeing these missiles that are, that are shot at us from a distance and, and explode and kill our, our loved ones, right? But so if you have never received the peace of Jesus in your heart and you try to share that scripture with somebody who's never received the peace of Jesus in their heart, they're thinking to themselves, what kind of peace has Jesus brought to this earth? But what they don't understand is, no, this is a, this is a gospel that touches the individual heart. <clears throat> Jesus is coming back one day to bring peace on this earth. But this is a gospel that touches an individual's That's heart. True. And that gospel and that peace, is it, it shows up at the altar. Amen. Amen. And it was called Jehovah Shalom because no matter what the chaos is in your life, no matter what it is that's going on in your life, if you'll trust in the Lord and his plan, amen, God will bring you a peace that surpasses understanding. He will bring peace. See, his birth started in a manger, but it ended on an altar. Colossians 1 verse 20. It says, Colossians 1 verse 20 says, And having made peace through the blood of his cross, by him to reconcile all things unto himself, by him I say, whether they be things in earth or things in heaven. You know, God is making right what's been wrong for a long time. I, I, I don't want to spend too much time on this. Sometimes I get, I, don't, I call it philosophical. I don't think it's bad. But I try to think outside the box when it comes to the gospel. And, and what I'm trying to say is, is that I have to take the body of knowledge that I've learned and I have to actually allow the part of my brain that's been renewed to think the way that God has taught me through his word. What I'm trying to say is, is that this scripture right here says that Jesus, through his cross and through the shedding of his blood, has made peace and that he brought reconciliation. That means that things that were apart have been brought back together. And what he says is, is that it's both things in earth and things in heaven. So that what that tells me is, is that there's been disturbance in the spiritual realm, not just on earth, but also in heaven. Well, that's not a real hard one to figure out. If you read Isaiah 14, Ezekiel uh, 27, where it talks about the enemy of God, it talks about the fact that he wanted to elevate himself above the throne of God. This happened in ages past before mankind was ever created. This happened before the world that we even know or exist on was ever the way that it was. There was a cataclysm that took place in the heavenly realm and a third of the angels of God put in their, threw in their lot with the enemy and it caused all kinds of chaos in the midst, in the atmosphere and also on the earth today because after Adam was born, uh, created, the enemy caused that same rebellion to enter into Adam's heart which has entered into the heart of man, the entirety of mankind now it finds itself in the midst of chaos. But what I'm trying to say is, is that God has a plan of peace. And while we right now are very focused on our own individual lives, Focused on paying our bills in our, in our houses, focused on raising our children, focused on all of those things. And God wants to bring peace even in the midst of those circumstances. What I try to remind you of today is that God's got a big old plan in place. God's got a big old plan in place and he's not wanting to just restore peace in your personal life, in your personal house. He's also restoring peace. He is going to restore peace upon this earth and he's also going to restore peace in the heavenly realm, there's going to be a time when the enemy of our soul will no longer be able to accuse us before our God day and night. God's going to, for lack of better words, clip his wings. And once he has his little final say so on earth, he's going to be thrown into Gehenna, which is the lake of fire. And it's all because of what Jesus did on the cross. He reconciled everything on earth. He reconciled everything in heaven. God has a plan and he's allowing you and I to be part of that plan. He's allowing you and I to engage, to take this gospel message, 
to share it with those that are lost out there. That's why this life is so important that we would give our lives to God and that we would live for the Lord. Because everything else is a temporary circumstance. Amen? I believe that. Sometimes I have to remind myself of it, but I believe it. Let's look at number three. Altar of remembrance. Exodus chapter 17, verse 15. The altar of remembrance. It says in Exodus chapter 17, verse 15. And Moses built an altar and called the name of it Jehovah Nisi. Again, we have a story of God's people being defeated by their enemies. In this case, it was the Amalekites. But God gave Moses victory and he wanted Moses to remember the victory. Build an altar and Moses named the altar Jehovah Nisi. The word Jehovah Nisi means God is my banner. A banner like a flag waving in the wind for the eye to make contact with and to be reminded. You know, memories are powerful things. Y'all know what I'm talking about? You just be driving down the road, a certain smell, certain vision, visual image captures your eye. And the next thing you know, some kind of neurochemical process takes place in your brain. And your brain's flooded with a memory of the ages of days gone by. Mm -hmm. And all of a sudden, it's like you're right there back at it again. Memories are powerful things. The, the altar right here was supposed to be a memory and a remembrance for Moses. What? To remember the victory that God provided for his people on that day. The altar is a place of victory. God wants us to be reminded of that. It's supposed to serve as a reminder that God did and God still will give victory. He wants us to be reminded that he gives us victory. He wants us to be reminded where he's brought us from. I didn't put it in here or to put the verse, but I can remember every time I talk about the memory of victories, it's like this one particular image shows up in my mind. I remember sharing it with Brother Larson the last time he was here when we went to go eat, and he seemed to enjoy it. And I don't know if he got as much out of it as I do, and maybe I don't know if y'all do either, but I just remember, I can never forget or get this image out of my mind about when David was running from Saul. Y'all remember the story? And he shows up at the, at the place of the high priest. And what does he ask the high priest? He says, don't you have a weapon here? And what does the high priest tell him? It's the sword. The sword. All I, only weapon I got here is the sword of Goliath. The giant that you killed. I get goosebumps every time I think of that. Because David leaves that high priest place with the sword of Goliath. And I mean, I'm imagining he's still a king. He might be on a run, but he's got a horse. And this is just how I imagine it. It doesn't say it exactly in the story. That big old sword strapped to that horse. As he's traveling, and I can't remember what the distance is, but it was several miles because I did the math one time, that, that David had to travel. And sitting there as he's riding on that horse and that sword's just sitting there flapping, maybe even slapping that horse in, in one spot in his muscle at every, every stride that the horse takes. And David's just sitting there looking at that sword. And you can't tell me that there's not this huge memory right. that floods his mind, that remembers on that day when he was but a little boy, shepherd boy, how God gave him victory. Amen. 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 And the Lord wants us to be reminded of the victories that he's given us in the past. Look at Ephesians chapter 2, verses 11 through 13. He says, wherefore, remember that ye being time past Gentiles in the flesh who are called uncircumcision by what that which is called the circumcision in the flesh made by hands, that at that time you were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world, but now in Christ Jesus Ye who sometimes were far off are made near by the blood of Christ. So let me just break this down for you. So Paul writes, he, he writes a letter to the church of Ephesus. All right. The, the church of Ephesus is a, is a bunch of people who do not know the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. They, they grew up in this little, in this city that takes place in this place called Asia Minor, where they worship a bunch of false gods. I've explained it to you before that they, they worship a false god named Diana. I won't describe her again. Last time I said something that was probably inappropriate. Anyway, they worship this false goddess named Diana. All right? And so that's, the, 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 it's a false pagan Greek 
or Roman goddess. I mean, it keeps reinventing itself, but it's basically it's a type of Satan is what it is. He keeps reinventing himself. It's another false Mary. <laughs> I said it. It's true. Another false Mary that gives birth to a false deity. It's been going on and reinventing itself time after time because that's what the enemy does. And so they did not know God. The God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, he revealed himself to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And through that revelation that he gave to them, he created a nation. And we know that through that nation, he gave us Jesus. And now the apostle Paul is telling all the world that doesn't know Jesus, at least everyone that he can get to, hey, there's a God in heaven. He was the God of the Jews. And he gave us Messiah who died on the cross, paid the penalty for sin. He is the one true God. There's only one way to access him. And you got to go through the altar. You got to put your faith in the sacrifice and it will connect you to the Lord. You used to be far away, but now you've been, been made near by the blood of Jesus Christ. And the Lord would want you to remember that, Ephesus. So that's how Paul would say it to them. But you know what he'd say it to us? You know what he'd say to us? Hey, you, young girl, whoever you were, that your parents paid money for you to go to the Christian school. Because they wanted you to know the Lord. And while you might not have been interested in knowing the Lord back then, the, they, they preached to you while you were going to that school, day in and day out. They might not have always said it just right, but those people's hearts were right in the sense that they believed that Jesus was the way and they told you. And at some point in time, the light bulb clicked on and you gave your heart to Jesus. Huh? And somebody else, he would say, hey... All of your life, you went and you were just living your life any old way you chose. And every now and then, God would send somebody to plant a seed. You were a Gentile. You were far away. But somebody would come to you and they would tell you, hey, you've been made near by the blood of Jesus. They might not have said that exactly that way, but that's essentially what they were doing. And at some point in time, it finally clicked and you gave your heart to the Lord. Jehovah Nisi, the God, Jehovah is the God, which is a banner. He's a God of remembrance. It's an altar of remembrance. The Lord wants us to remember, amen, where he's brought us from. See, sometimes I get worried about kids that grow up in the church. I'm just going to be honest with you. I get worried about kids. I get worried about my own children that have been brought up in the church. Why? Because sometimes I wonder, did, did the enemy ever really deliver you from anything? Listen to me. We all, no matter how long we, as long as we're breathing on this earth, we're going to go through things and we're going to find ourselves facing challenges on this earth. But let me tell you something. If the Lord has ever delivered you from anything before, you have a memory, amen, of how God right. showed up and he delivered you in that circumstance. The question I get concerned about regarding church kids is did the Lord ever deliver you from anything? Or did you just skate through in an easy life because your parents did the best that they could to try to raise you in the ways of God and you yourself don't have a memory where you see Goliath's sword on your horse. You've never been defeated by the Amalekites or at least you don't know that you are being defeated by the Amalekites and you don't know any better, right? And you've never experienced a victory in your life to where you would remember and hear what the Apostle Paul would say or what Moses was saying whenever he built that altar to the Lord Jehovah Nisi, God is my banner, and he wants to remember that he gave us victory over our enemy. Listen to me, I get concerned about that. But one thing I can tell you is, is that if you're a Christian and you've given your heart to the Lord, there was a reason that you gave your heart to the Lord. See, Ted Turner said one time on TBS, he said, Christians are cripples. And they, no, I'm sorry, Christians, Christians are weak, they need a crutch. And I can remember somebody was talking about that, and they said, yeah, well, a crippled man needs a crutch. You see, the problem is, is that people that don't even, if you gave your heart to the Lord, it's likely that you realized you needed him. You might not have thought you were weak. I mean, it might have been because your parents told you that God was good and he was worthy enough to be praised. And that's all good, too. Amen. But for some reason, you realize you needed the Lord and you surrendered yourself to that. God wants us to remember, amen, that he provided victory for us. He wants us to remember that we are his, amen, and he desires for us to serve him. We should never forget what the Lord has done. This is the last one, number four, the altar of provision. Genesis 22, verse 14. The altar of provision. It says, and Abraham called the name of that place Jehovah Jireh, as it is said to this day. In the mouth of the Lord, it shall be seen. Jehovah the provider. God is my provider. 
Amen. And we know the story. We, I don't think you can wear out a story as beautiful as this. But if there's a story that we've preached many times, it's certainly this one, right? Whenever, what, a better, what better story is there to tell the New Testament gospel in the Old Testament? Where the father would offer up his son as a sacrifice on a hill. Amen. And we know the story that Abraham's going to believe God and he's going to do what God's asked him to do. He's believed God all of his life. He, but yet at the same time, he finds himself empty. And when God finally shows up and says, I'm going to give you the seed that I promised you. He, God turns around and says, now I want you to offer him up as a sacrifice. Mm -hmm. And at the last second, when he's about to plunge the knife, what? There's a ram whose horns are caught in a brush of thicket. A thicket of brush, right? And, and this is a sacrifice that God allows to be offered in the place of Isaac, Abraham's son. Now, one of the things that Abraham told Isaac when they were walking up the hill, because Isaac said, Father, I see, the, I see the wood, I see the fire. Where's the sacrifice? <laughs> the Lord will provide him a sacrifice, son. Abraham believed God that day. And you know what the Lord did? He provided himself a sacrifice. And that's what God did in Jesus. He provided a sacrifice. God, our provider. You know, one of the things I like to say to people is, is this, is that sometimes people don't know how they're going to pay for their next meal. They don't know how they're going to pay their electric bill. They don't, and, and, and many times, because those things are so real, they're so focused on the day-to-day -day life, right, that they need God to be their provider to pay for that or to handle that situation. And that's real stuff. <laughs> But what I'm here to tell you was, is that what he really provided on that day was a sacrifice. That's right, Jesus. But the good news is this. On that altar of sacrifice, he provided covenant with man. An agreement. An agreement that he would be your God and that you could be his people. And he will take care of his people. He's desiring that we would trust him, though, in the midst of all of that. Listen to me. The enemy wants nothing more than to cause a lack of peace in your life and to cause stress to take place because of the things that are going on in your life. Listen. You be led by the Lord, you hear his voice, but you don't try to make it happen in your own strength. If you try to make it happen in your own strength, they're going to cause frustration and chaos. Listen, even when it doesn't show up the way you expect it to, you continue to trust the Lord. Matthew chapter 6, verses 9 through 11. I'm closing with this because God is our provider. Amen. Amen. I just want you to know that this morning. It's an altar of provision. You got to understand that God created, he cut covenant with man. What does covenant mean? It, well, it's an agreement. God's made an agreement with mankind that he wants to be your God and he will be your provider. That's what the word of God says in Matthew 6, 9 through 11. It says, after this manner, therefore, pray ye. This is Jesus talking to his disciples. Pray ye, our father, which art in heaven. You know, he's not so far away that he can't be heard right. or that he can't hear. Amen. You got to remember that he's in heaven, but that means he's overall, he's sovereign overall. Hallowed be your name. You're holy. That's what the word hallowed means. It means sanctified. It means separated out. You want to talk about separation? That's what it means. It means to be separated out from all the other gods. There is no God like the God of heaven. Amen. All the others are false and fake and they can't get nothing done. It says, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Listen, one day God is going to allow the peace that has taken place, at least in his, his part of heaven. There's peace up there because he got rid of the liar. Amen. There might be some chaos in the second heavens. He's going to clear that up one day too. But listen to me, there's peace. One day though, God's going to bring his kingdom from heaven to the earth. And in the meantime, even though we're experiencing lack of peace, chaos, various things taking place in the midst of our life, you can rest assured that God, if we will ask him, he will take care of our daily provision, what it is that we need. Amen. He doesn't always give us more than what we want. Sometimes he does. The more you can see that he can trust us with certain things, the more that he'll give us in another area. But listen to me. He will provide for us daily.